God, tonight we want to give you all the glory. We confess, Father, that we have not been truthful to the fact that you're the only one worthy of all the praise. I confess with my tongue, God, many times, even today, I've tried to act like I was the one worthy of all the praise. So, Father, I'm asking that you would come into this place, not because we deserve it, but because you're faithful. Not because of anything we've done, but because of your great love that pursues us unrelentingly. Not because, Father, there's anything in this place that is good enough for you, but because you're so good, you'll come low and change hearts and save people and set us free. So, Lord, let your word and your truth ring forth tonight. Let it ring forth boldly and do, Father, what only you can do, a miracle in this place. The greatest miracle of all is what I'm asking for, God, which is not healing of the sick or setting the captives free, but is taking a heart of stone and making it soft again, to letting us be led into a place of free choice where we truly and freely choose you above any other master. I ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who is risen and sits on the throne. Amen. In January of 2015, for one entire month, a 17-year-old wore a doctor's jacket, and he passed as an OBGYN at a hospital in Florida. He had it embroidery that said Dr. Kent, OBGYN, and the nurses called him doctor, and the doctors called him doctor, and the patients called him doctor, until finally someone realized that this was not the truth. Just this past Wednesday, the 7th of October, a gentleman who had been running a practice, a thriving practice in San Francisco, California, he had been doing surgeries and he had been doing liposuction, he had been doing facial and dermatology treatments, he had actually been doing plastic surgery on people and been doing it for a while. And on Wednesday, he was convicted of fraud because indeed he was not a doctor at all, and serving up to possibly 36 years in prison now. But he had the patients believing him, and his office staff believing him, and the community believing him, in what in fact was a complete ruse. 21-year-old Beth is telling her story to a journalist who's taking down and writing notes for an article that will be published that tells her story of how for 21 years of her life, she loved her father and she adored her father and she gave her father all the grace and latitude he needed to go on his work trips because she believed that her dad was the most amazing thing on earth and that he loved her and adored her and cared for her and the reason he had been missing her birthdays consistently was because he had to work and the reason that he missed her recital was because he had to go on that work trip and the reason that he wasn't there for her graduation was because he had to work to provide for the family. But she reports to the journalist that she had actually recently found out that for 28 years before she was ever born, her father has had two wives and two families. And she has three half-brothers that she didn't even know existed until she was 21 years old. And all the trust and all the faith and all the love that she'd been stowing upon him because she thought she knew who she was came crashing down in this feeling of betrayal and this feeling of I have no idea who this man who calls himself my father is. And where do I go from here? Because the one that I thought that I was close to, it turns out I don't know him at all. I want to tell you tonight that I have come for something that the enemy took from us a long time ago, and we keep letting him take it habitually over and over and over again, our trust. Because I'm here to tell you today, guys, that intimacy and closeness cannot exist without trust. And when it tries to, it's a hot mess. You can, you can probably think of four or five people in your life right now, some of them probably sitting in the audience, that actually are trying to have intimate, close relationships with someone that they do not trust. 
and it looks like a mess because you're checking their phone constantly, you're trying to find out who they were texting or who they talked to, what did they do with that free class period they had because you don't trust them. And trust is actually necessary in order for me to share vulnerably with you and for you to share vulnerably with me. Because if I trust you, then I can show you every part of me and I don't have to worry that you're gonna misuse it or that you're gonna treat it callously. I don't have to worry about hearing about it from three or four people that are removed from me because you can't keep it to yourself. If I trust you, I actually am willing to go to deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper places with you, places that I never imagined we could go in relationship because we have a foundation of trust. But the enemy is wreaking havoc in our lives, in the world's lives, in the church life because he's flipped the script and he wants us to think, well, you can have intimacy without trust. Or even, I, I, I want to hypothesize to you today, the enemy is even happier if you try to have commitment without trust. And there's a lot of people that go to church every week who are committed to saying they're a Christian, but don't trust the Christ that they serve. And this is part of the reason why the church is so ineffective, because the world looks at us and the world sees a group of committed people that are going to just hold doctrine and really press that stuff, but they don't see a group of people who trust Christ that they profess to follow and be committed to. So what will we do with this conundrum of trust? I want to take you through a journey of how trust actually is formulated because the enemy has this really clear and he's been coming from your trust since the garden. And I want you to take really careful note that he didn't come for Eve's commitment to God. He didn't even come for her closeness, her intimacy with God. He came for her trust. Because he knew if he could get her trust, then all those other things would fall like dominoes. And even if commitment didn't fall away, then he was perfectly content for her to be committed to God and not trust God. Because that paints a terrible picture of the creator that she says she serves. I want to read with you a scripture that will help us see clearly how the enemy has been coming for our trust since day one and still continues to come for it. If you turn your Bibles with me to Genesis, we're gonna look at Genesis chapter two, verses 16 and 17, and then just chapter three, a few parts from verses one to five. I wanna show you this fascinating thing about the book of Genesis. In those first three books of the Bible, some very fundamental, foundational context is given that is pertinent for the rest of human history. And we miss those things, but the enemy has keenly caught these three things that are foundational for the rest of human history. One of them is that God is the source. He's the source. Second one is that relationship is primary. And third, God is judge. We don't have time to go over God is the source and God is judge, although they're fascinating. Tonight, we're going to focus on what the enemy focused on in the garden. Really straightforward. Relationship is primary. Relationship is primary. This is what had happened, and this is what God had said in Genesis 2, verse 16 and 17. God said, surely you shall eat of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for if you eat of it, you will die. And this is what Satan had said that God said in Genesis chapter 3, just some parts from 1 to 5. Has God indeed said that you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? You shall not surely die, for God knows in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. I want you to understand that Satan understood the formula that trust is required for intimacy and closeness to flourish. And because trust is required for intimacy and closeness to flourish, he had to come up with a way to get Adam and Eve to stop trusting God and to start trusting him. Now this is where we've got it twisted as well a lot, especially those people who sit in the audience who have been through abuse and oppression, because we think that trust is just something you choose to do. We, akin it, we liken it to love, because love is a choice that you can make outside of circumstance or outside of condition. That agape love, it loves whether you're doing good or whether you're doing bad. And it's true, love is a choice that I can make to love you regardless of what you do to me. But trust, friends, is not. Trust actually is informed by behavior. 
And oftentimes, we're trying to trust people that are not trustworthy. We actually spend a lot of time doing exactly the opposite of what the definition of trust is. Trust would say, I actually believe deeply that this thing is reliable, that this thing is dependable, that this thing is truth, and that this thing is able. And we spend a lot of time in relationships with people that we do not believe are reliable, that we do not believe are dependable, that we do not believe are truthful, and that we do not believe are able. And the enemy has come in cunningly to take our trust and to actually attribute distrust to God and trust to the lie that he has told us. I want to show you that while he knew that he could not get our trust by truth, because God had already spoken the truth, he said, I'm going to get their trust by deceit. And that's when he began this amazing affront to humanity. And he's been lying to us ever since, guys, ever since. John 8, says that he's the father of lie. It's consistent with his character when he lies because that's what he does. And we act surprised sometimes. So if I'm going to have a real relationship that's a working relationship that really can grow in deep intimacy, I have to have a foundation of trust. And the parent of trust is truth. And the child of trust is intimacy, is closeness. So the enemy just flips the script and says, I'll make the parent of trust deceit, and then I'm happy for trust to be birthed. But guess what? If deceit is the parent and the birthing is trust, the next child that's produced is not intimacy. It's not closeness. It's pseudo-closeness and pseudo-intimacy that's masquerading as something that will fulfill you, but it never does. And that's why you stay stuck in cycle after cycle after cycle because you believe that it's trust, and if it's trust, then it must be going to fulfill me sooner or later. That's why Beth is so distraught because she trusted her father. She gave him all of her trust and all of her allegiance and all of the benefit of the doubt, and then she realized this is not based, this trust is not based on truth. This trust is based on a lie. I don't know him at all. And this, friends, is what God has been trying to get you to hear. I will not lie to you. I have not lied to you. And I'm willing to live in this redemptive time so that you will get the big picture and see that I'm not the liar in this scenario. The enemy is the liar. And we guys have become really swift agents of the enemy because deceit is one of the human's favorite thing to do. And I want to propose to you that we actually perpetuate pseudo-intimacy. We actually perpetuate pseudo-closeness. And we do it for one of two reasons. One, because we're afraid of rejection. So in order for me to really be close to you, I have to unveil myself to you and be willing to take risk and let you see me for who I am. But because I'm afraid of rejection, I won't unveil myself to you. And you see this happen all the time. Well, they might not think I'm cool if they really know I hate LeBron. So I'll just not tell them that. <laughs> I'll not show that part of myself to them. But then we really can't connect in a way that you know me and I know you because I'm not letting you know that stuff. Or, you know what, if they know that I have an STD, they probably won't stay with me. So I won't tell them that information. And that reveals the second reason why we actually operate in deceit, in order to gain what we think is closeness, but in fact is pseudo-closeness. It's fake, it's not real. The second reason why we operate in deceit is because we love control. So the first reason why we operate in deceit is because we're afraid of rejection and we're afraid that you won't love us. The second reason we operate in deceit is because we love control. And we are some people who love control. So I can get you to stay with me by withholding the information that I have an STD, so I don't tell you that because I want to control you and I want you to stay with me. And we do things like that over and over and over again. And what the enemy did in the garden, guys, was he operated out of deceit to make us think that we could have this intimacy, which is false intimacy. And we've been falling for this model over and over again.
because the enemy was afraid would reject him because the spirit of prophecy tells us that he had already visited the other worlds and the other worlds rejected him. So he was afraid of rejection and also the enemy loves control. Just the opposite of what God loves. God loves freedom and free will. Part of the risk that we live in today is because we know if free will is going to be true, then deceit and evil must also exist. So if deceit and evil also must exist and free will exist, I am going to be taking a risk every time I get in relationship with you. And also the enemy has said in my mind over and over again, you're taking a risk every time you trust God. You're taking a risk every time you really reveal yourself to him. And the lies that the enemy has told us go something like this, that's too bad. God can't forgive you for that one. That's too sick, that's too messed up, you're too sinful. And then we believe that lie, and we are afraid that God will reject us so we don't reveal ourselves to him, and we don't keep it real with him, and we actually isolate ourselves and actually detriment our own existence because we aren't responding to that relationship that God said, no, it's not me that condemns you because we believed the deceit. The other thing that the enemy does because he loves control so much is he actually, control and deceit are manipulation. That's why it's completely opposite of who God is because he does not do that. So the enemy is busy constantly trying to get you to love control as well, to make you feel like the safe zone is the zone that you're in control of. But guess what guys, when you're in control, who's not in control? God. And every time that you try to take control, you're doing exactly what the enemy did, and you're putting yourself on the throne and saying, I know the right way. So I will manipulate this through deceit because if I don't, I won't get what I want or get this. I won't get what I think is right. And maybe what I think is right is right, but me trying to control its outcome is not me trusting God to control its outcome. So then again, I've settled for pseudo-closeness and pseudo-intimacy, and I actually begin to get further and further and further away from this creator, which is why we can have churches full of committed people without any power in them, because we don't actually trust the God who said, I have died for you, I rose again for you, and I'm here ready, able, and willing not only to forgive your sins, but to make you a new person from the inside out. That's the closeness that God craves to have with us. That's the closeness that he's been looking for and seeking out for. That's the closeness that he desires to intimately be in fellowship with you in. I want to show you a biblical example because you might think, mm, she's preaching some crazy stuff. But I want to show you that we have bought this lie so wholeheartedly and we actually are so inoculated to it that we don't even see it. And it's clear in the Bible over and over again. We attribute things to God that are not godly. And we call them godly because we want to be in control. <laughs> we call them godly because we think it solves a problem. We actually try to control God because we don't trust him to use his tools, which are truthful, to actually solve the problem or alleviate my pain. So we choose the enemy's tools in order to solve the problems and alleviate our pain. This is exactly what the parable is talking about in the Bible when he says he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. Because if you'll notice, and if you read that parable at the end of Matthew chapter 25, he clearly talks about the sheep and the goats, and they both thought they knew God. They both thought that they served God. The one group that actually was, though, didn't recognize when it was they were doing that thing. And the one group who actually weren't serving and following God thought that they were doing it all the time. And what they were doing in the name of God actually was contrary to God because they were trying to control and live by their very rigid set of rules that they called the law and attributed to God. Don't touch, don't associate, don't feel, don't taste. We did all of that. So how can you say, get away from me, that you never knew me, God? When did I see you hungry and not feed you? When did I see you thirsty and not give you drink? When were you a stranger and I didn't visit you? When were you sick or imprisoned and I wasn't there? And Jesus said, and as much as you didn't do it to any one of these, you didn't do it to me. Because they were so busy trying to control 
what was religion, not what was godly. So if we want true, deep relationship with God, we've got to be willing to say, Father, what have I been believing? I ask you into my life right now to survey my thought life and my belief life and to reveal to me what is a lie that causes me into a relationship of trust that does not birth closeness, but instead births this pseudo relationship. And that's why I'm always left dissatisfied at church. And that's why I'm always left dissatisfied in my daily devotional life, because I'm not doing it out of a place that trusts you. I'm doing it out of a place to feel like I could earn you, or I'm doing it out of a place to feel like I could control you, so you'll make the world look like what I think righteousness looks like, instead of you making the world as you know it should be. Have mercy, God settling for pseudo relationship when his arms are stretched wide to have us in deep, real, and authentic relationship. I'm gonna ask Josh to come forward and, and play. And as I do, I want you really to think about how many lies are your Christian, is your Christian faith operating out of? How many things do you attribute to God that are either your own projection and you're calling it holy, or just straight a lie from the pit of hell that he would have you believe that in fact is not part of God's character, that in fact is the antithesis of who God is? I want to just remind yourself and remind me, because as God broke this down to me, he broke it down and said, June, some of the stuff you don't trust me for, you're not even recognizing that you don't trust me. You haven't begun to see the layers and layers of deceit that you have swallowed and called truth. You haven't begun to really let me break away and tear away some places that if you would, I'll take you into such a sweet closeness with me that your life cannot help but be changed. So I hope you're asking tonight after I broke all this down, so what do I do? What do I do to get close? Because that's the practical part of it. I wanna give you this example of Job because I love what Job did. And I think you're all um, familiar with Job's story. He went through some stuff. And I want you to recognize that every one of his friends who came to talk to him told him what? Lies. <laughs> And they did it in the name of God. Well, you must have done this. You must have done that. You must be a sinner. Just one lie after another, steady coming at him. But Job said this in the face of all those lies that even himself was tempted to believe, that even he wanted to buy into at times because at least would give some sense and some control to a situation that seemed to make no sense at all. But Job said, in Job chapter 13, verse 15, he believed God was good. I'm sorry, Job believed that God was good no matter what things looked like or how they appeared. And this is what he said, even though God might kill me, I will trust in him alone and I will argue my case to his face. That's the kind of intimacy God's looking for with you that regardless of how things look, regardless of how things appear, regardless of if you are tempted to believe that God's going to kill me, that you will not back down from responding and pursuing Him because He's pursuing you with abandon. That you actually would say, I got to argue my case with you, God. I got to get before you on this thing because I don't understand it and I'm somewhat fearful that the way I understand it actually is a lie and not the truth. So I have to get in your face, God, so you can break down the truth to me so that I I will not be moved off of this trust that births an intimate closeness in you that nothing else will afford. So it starts with God, and it continues with God, and it finishes with God. So I, I want to invite you tonight to just join me here because I'm going to make a stand, and it's an offensive stand to say, God, reveal to me where I'm not trusting you, and then God, build trust in me. Build trust in me so that I can go to this wild, intimate place with you. If you're willing to ask that prayer to God, then join me here and let's stand together as an offense to the enemy to let him know we're taking territory back that was taken from us, to let him know that I 
will pursue God and I will trust his voice and his voice alone. Sometimes we think scares like, prayers like that are scary, but I want to tell you, if you trust God, which is the prayer you're asking, no matter what comes next is in his hand. And if you trust God, then you will actually be able to say, Lord, if it's good, if it's bad, if it's sideways, I'm in your hand. And just like Job, I will not remove myself until I get an audience face to face with the King and I hear from you what is true. waiting to be close to us, guys. He's going to do, when we ask, He listens. One of the things we forget and one of the lies we've believed is that we pray a prayer and then we think it was just a cultural thing we did. And we don't look to see what happens next. So I want to tell you tonight, as you pray this prayer, God, reveal to me where I'm not trusting you and help me step by step trust you. Pay attention to what happens next, because what happens next will be God working to take you down that very path that you have surrendered tonight. But I also want you to pay attention to what happens next, because the enemy's mad when we're on the offense, and tonight we're taking an offensive stand. So he's going to try to come with more lies, and he's going to try to come with more deception. So that's why you've got to put yourself into God and His Word. You've got to put yourself in close people that you can trust, so that you will actually have someone to bounce it off of and say, is this true or am I crazy? Because sometimes some of the stuff we believe is crazy. Let's ask God to give us trust and to deepen our relationship. Holy God, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for teaching me this word. Thank you for it being an indictment to me. Thank you, Father, for showing me that your indictments are not condemnations, but redemptions. So tonight, Father, thank you for redeeming us. Thank you for convicting our hearts in such a way that says, I've been believing lies and I've been operating in pseudo closeness when you want to really be intimate with me. So I ask in the name of Jesus Christ that you would expose every lie that we have believed, that we would stand firmly on what your word promises that you came to set captives free no matter what has bound them, that you came, Lord, to bind up the brokenhearted no matter what broke their heart, that you, God, came to give sight to the blind no matter what veiled their vision, that that's the God we serve and that's the truth of who he is. So help us, Lord, to get in close, intimate relationship to you, that everything we do is just a natural act of worship because we love you so much and we trust you so much. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.